Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So good to have you with us as we do our study in the book of Titus. And we'll be starting in chapter 3, uh, verse 3, but uh, just a little review. Chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Titus talk about how we should get along with one another in the church. Talks about elders and their qualifications. And talks about older men and older women and how older women should teach the younger women, and then how younger men should behave, how slaves should re interact with their masters. And then it starts to turn its attention to uh, the church and how they should interact with those outside the church. It says here in verse 1 of chapter 3, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. And so, when this was written, uh, a republic, uh, a democracy um, that we have in the United States and uh, freedom of religion and, and many of the things we take for granted, um, they weren't really hammered out like they are now. And uh, there were people who still lived under kings and queens, people who lived under uh, military dictatorships. Um, Rome had a type of government that uh, had laws and things, but Nevertheless, they were very down on the Christians, as it later came out. And so, as we see this, uh, we have this information given in a period of time. And it says, remind them to be subject to rulers. Well, who was the ruler at the time? Well, it was Nero. Nero in the uh, Empire of Rome. Uh, and um, he wasn't so bad at the beginning as long as Burrus and Seneca were giving him advice and Agrippina, but he's got older and started to exercise his wings, and turns out he was a very corrupt man, and he, uh, Burrus died, it may be the same year that Paul had gotten his trial and was released, and then Seneca was caused to retire, and later on they had made him drink hemlock, and uh, he put his own mother to death, and then also his uh, uh, stepbrother. And so as a result of this, uh, there were people that got in around Nero, and he turned bad, and there was that fire uh, in Rome, and he blamed the Christians for it. And many believe that he probably just did that himself so he could tear down that area, that poor area of Rome, and rebuild it. And uh, so he blamed the Christians and started persecuting them. And here was Paul preaching the gospel. They caught him, and they brought him to Rome in 67 uh, AD and gave him another trial and beheaded him. Then one year later, Nero... Uh, he committed suicide, poisoned himself or something like that, uh, because um, he was in such disfavor. He saw the handwriting on the wall and preferred that method of being put out. Well, my friends, um, we have a government right now that permits us to criticize them and uh, to speak our mind, but it isn't that way every place. And when you are under a communist government or uh, the Indians in India, they have a Hindu dominated country and they, they think the Christians, even though they believe in a God are practically atheists because they only believe in one and they have problems with them. And uh, we call them idolaters. And you really have to learn to keep your head down 
And although you want to share the gospel so people can get saved, you have to mind your P's and Q's because persecution comes your way. And uh, so what you have to do is be a law-abiding, uh, beneficial citizen of the state. And uh, if you do those things, uh, they'll give you a pass sometimes on your religion and allow you to exist. Meanwhile, uh, you pray for them and you be obedient and be ready to do good works. You don't malign anyone. And uh, so some places where you can say what you want about somebody's policies, they see that as maligning them and you end up in jail. And so this is good advice to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Paul in another place uh, tells us to pray for the leaders and pray uh, Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And you pray to God through Jesus Christ and say, Oh God, we pray that this man would get saved. We pray that this man would make good decisions. We pray that he would come to his senses and see that there is a God in heaven, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. You know, you got to you gotta wonder. Here was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were thrown into a fiery furnace, and here he was seeing them walking around unsinged, even with a fourth person in there. And uh, this has got to have uh, made him think. Now, what recently happened to uh, former President Trump when he got his ear shot, and they were shooting for his head, the young man, and he turned his head just at that time, and maybe he was rushed just a little bit because he knew the police had seen him up there, and so he was trying to ha make it happen. And uh, so all of these things happened in such a way, perhaps the angel's hand turned his head a little bit more, unaware of it, and he had his ear shot instead of uh, it going straight through his head. Well, that has affected people. And uh, they have seen the hand of God. And if people in this country can see the hand of God, perhaps in protecting former President Trump, perhaps Nebuchadnezzar could see through the very dire circumstances that poor Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to go through. They, they were tumbled into a fiery furnace. And yet, this is the way in which God used to testify to Nebuchadnezzar to break through the ice and to help him understand there was a God in heaven. And it was the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and he best listened to them. Of course, you know, people learn their lessons hard, and he had to eat grass for another seven years like an animal, and finally his mind came back to him, and he looked up to heaven and he submitted to God and said he raises up who he wills and brings down who he will. And uh, therefore, uh, sometimes the stuff that we Christians have to go through and the persecutions and the things that they do to us in the prisons and all the stuff that happens is part of God's plan to break through the noise and allow these people to see us as human beings and to see God's mighty hand. Well, my friends, uh, so here we are. We're supposed to malign no one and be peaceable and gentle and pray for these people. Some of these rulers will be practically unbearable, like Nero. And so it's very, very sad. There have been times when Christians have been persecuted severely, and then they drive them underground the church gets purified. People that believe in Jesus Christ really do believe in Jesus Christ. And the church becomes stronger and stronger. And then all of a sudden it breaks forth and there's this large number of Christians. So uh, what should we do about this? Well, he said in verse 3, if somebody, if 
like for instance if some ruler is acting out uh, remember your former way of life for we also once were foolish ourselves we were unsaved at one time disobedient deceived enslaved to various lusts and pleasures spending our life in malice and envy hateful hating one another so uh, let's remind ourselves of what we were like before we were saved. And it'll give us some empathy for these rulers and pray that they would get saved. And uh, if you look at the original language, you know, there's a lot lost in the translation. And this is one of those passages. And it says here, for we also once were foolish ourselves. That literally in the Greek is uh, the word not and minded or no minded you were without a mind you were completely out of your mind without a mind you were foolish you weren't thinking straight and uh, so you you were out of your mind uh, a lot of people myself included uh, when we became saved and we gave our life to Jesus Christ and realized what he had done for us on the cross and that we were sinners and we had to have him. And when I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, I had heard it ever since I was a boy. But somehow or another, I didn't realize and didn't pull the trigger on that. And I made it my own by accepting Jesus Christ there in my bedroom at Ohio State University, the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. It was like a light came on in my mind and I had a different perspective. And I was no longer run by my lusts. I was no longer enslaved to the sin. I, it was like I was on a, a treadmill, couldn't get off. And then all of a sudden I could stepped off and I wasn't being raced anymore. And I could see the world from a different perspective. I might be in the world even, with the fish in the sea, but now I was a porpoise. And I had to come up to get air and to be in contact with the world above. So even though I swam in the world, I had contact vitally with the world up above and I had a different perspective. I was no longer a fish. I was a porpoise. I was no longer an unsaved man. Now I was a Christian, really a Christian. So I came to having a mind. It was kind of like Pinocchio. And here he was, he was a puppet. But then all of a sudden he became a real live boy. So he got himself a mind. And then not only were we uh, without a mind, um, once we were foolish ourselves, and disobedient. The word disobedient means we were not persuadable. Uh, not obedient, not persuadable. We came by this naturally. Remember Adam and Eve? And uh, something inside of them made them choose the wrong path. They decided to disregard all the evidence they had for the existence of God and his kindness and his goodness and to believe this snake that just blew in from out of town and was talking to her and she ate that fruit and the man did it too. Now, when we as parents have little children, we don't teach them to be disobedient. And we have to teach them to be obedient. It seems like they have a gearing where they want to do their own thing. They don't want to listen to mom and dad. Don't touch the stove, honey. It's hot. They stand right there, look at you, and then they reach their little hand out and they touch that stove. And they learn the hard way, if they learn at all. And so, my friends, uh, we have been born with a penchant to be disobedient. And our parents are trying to drill in our mind, you hold my hand when we come to that street. You wait and you don't go across that street without mommy and daddy helping you. 
And what do they do? They want to run. They forget all about it. Or they want to run out on that street. They think they know what they can do. And they're not reliable. And it's like they don't have a mind. And they're disobedient. So we have to teach them to be obedient. Um, there's the gearing to be disobedient. Um, then it says here, for we also once were foolish ourselves without a mind, disobedient, when to go our own way, deceived. Now that word deceived is the word planomenoi. And if you heard the beginning of that word plano, if I were to just put the ET on the end and set a menoi, that would be our word planet. And what the ancients had seen was that when they looked up in the sky, there were stars. They'd start over here in the east, and then they'd just kind of have a course that they would do. And they'd end up in the west, and then when they got daylight, uh, they would disappear. But then in the next night, they were over here again, and they would move just like that. And, and so they were stars. But then there were these other uh, stars, they would call them stars, they didn't know real well the difference, and they didn't have that. They kind of went like different places, and so they called them planero, or wanderers. And what they were were planets that were revolving around the sun, and the sun was a star that had its way. It started in the east and went in the west, but then there was these planets that were whirling around them, and they could see some of them, and so they called them the wanderers. Well, the people, this word here is that we were deceived and we were wanderers, and we went after our own way. We didn't have that orbit, that way of going across the sky that was dependable and the same every night. And so, my friends, we were wanderers. And we uh, have to be careful. There are people who, they say they believe the Bible. Oh, yes, they believe the Bible. Then when you get in there, uh, they just preach everything but the Bible. It's kind of a bait and switch thing. And you have to be careful because there are people who even call themselves Christians they really are wanderers. They are off the path. They're off the way of truth. And so beware of that. But you don't want to be a wanderer. What happens when you become a Christian is that you're told, believe the Bible. It's Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. You get oriented. And you're no longer a wanderer anymore and deceived by the prince of this world. Next, as we look here, we see not only were we without a mind and disobedient and wanderers, but we were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Um, it uh, literally is slaving for our lusts. That's what it says in the Greek, slaving for our lusts. We have these desires, and because we want those things that desires lead us to. Basically, we are working so that we can have our lusts fulfilled. And uh, just imagine a drug addict. He wants to feel, have that feeling. He wants to have that drug in his system. But the drug costs things. And he's ever having to use a higher and higher dose to get the same amount of pleasure. And so now he's working just to feed his lust. Uh, it's a terrible thing. And yet, that's an extreme example. There are people that are caught up in expensive hobbies and gambling. And, uh, you know, there are young men now that live in the basement of their parents' homes. And they never go anyplace else. And when they get home from the job that they have, they go down in their basement, come up maybe for a meal, and while they're down there, they look at pornography, 
and they play video games. Instead of starting a family, living, their, their whole life is bound up in these things. Now, that doesn't mean that there are people who play video games and aren't raced by them, but these people, they're following after their lusts, many of them. Their life is aimless just to feed their pleasurable habits. Um, it's an exacting price that it extracts from us and it enslaves us in a way of living. And there are people who cook meth in their home and you have to be careful to rent to people that they don't cook meth in the house that you rent to them. So then you have to tear out all the walls. It's in this poison that they brew, gets into the uh, drywall and, and furniture and curtains and everything. And you have to rip it all out and redo practically the whole house. They come in there and they find meth in that house that you've been making. They take your children out of there because it's dangerous for them. And uh, you lose your children and you get sent to jail. This has happened to people that uh, were associated with some of the churches I pastored. And uh, it, it's a terrible way, terrible thing. And they're just raced by this. So they're working for their lusts. They're enslaved to their lusts, in servitude to their lusts. Um, scores in the uh, I step are going down because kids are just playing video games, watching TV, obesity is rampant, and so it's something we have to be very, very careful about. Um, then, not only that, does it say that we were once foolish, without a mind, disobedient, unpersuadable? Um, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy. Now, that literally is just simply the word in and envy, and in and uh, malice. And uh, it means that we are submersed into these things. We're in them. Envy and malice. And uh, it's just how we thought. We're always envious of somebody. We're always not feeling good about somebody that is doing better than us. We're jealous of them. We're envious of them. We have meanness toward them. We can't say a nice thing about them. Can't be happy for what they accomplish because we wish we were doing that. We don't want them to have attention because we want the attention. And so it's just a horrible way to live and to be. And all kinds of mean and rotten things come out of our mouth because of jealousy and envy and malice that we have for somebody else. The great I cannot stand any other rooster being on top of that rock, even though the rock that the rooster's on top is not all that. But yet we want to be there. We want the attention. We had a person just recently that tried to kill President Trump, former President Trump. Why was he doing that? There are various reasons that people are coming up with. They don't know his motives. But some of the th these things that were done, which by some people was just to get 15 minutes of fame or infamy. And so there are people who have all kinds of motivations. Um, this gets to be woven so deep into everyday chatter, it's hard to extract from it. Uh, when Isaiah saw the throne of God and the creatures around the throne of God saying, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of your glory. And he was so convicted by the transcendency and greatness of God, that he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Well, my friends, we are submerged here in the United States of America, and other places, I might add, of envy and strife 
and wickedness and mean ways of saying things, so much so that when you say, I'm not going to do that anymore, you appear so much more different than anybody else. Um, one of the things that I hate about uh, uh, YouTube and all these other things is always the F-bomb. Um, people just don't, can't hardly, t they use it as an adjective, even, as they're describing something. I mean, every other word. And I know people that have gotten saved, and when they got saved, they lost half of their vocabulary because they no longer want to use those words. And my friends, it's also that way, running down people, putting them down. You can disagree with somebody's policies or maybe how they go about doing things, but that, that's one thing. But running down the person just to run them down and calling them names, that's another thing. So there is all this stuff going on. We're in various lusts and pleasures that enslave us, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And, uh, you know, you, you see, here you have a world religion, Islam, and they believe that the world would be better off if there were no Jews in it. And they, the Hamas, uh, they attacked Israel, raped the women, and killed babies. And there are people in the United States of America that believe that Israel should be wiped off the map. We're an ally with Israel. And yet there are people in the Islamic faith, not all I might add, that believe that Jews should be exterminated. And this is awful. The Jews, on the other hand, don't believe that they should be. But nevertheless, uh, this is how the things go. Um, so there's all this hate. Now, if you have a ruler who is prone to having envy and, and malice and, and he doesn't think the way you do, and he's disobedient to God, doesn't even care about God, doesn't even believe in God, all he's doing is being like an unbeliever. And what we have to do is put ourselves in his place and say, I was like that at one time, and now my mind has changed. And since there's one mediator between man and God, the God, the man Christ Jesus, I'm going to pray to Jesus Christ and ultimately to God. We pray Jesus is God. We pray to him and the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, Trinitarians. And uh, we pray, Lord, change this man's mind. Help him to see who you are. Help him understand that he's a sinner, that he's not thinking right, and get the proper perspective and orientation from God and help them because it says here then this is like what we were verse 4 but verse 4 when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done we got nothing not by deeds that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And so we want this ruler and we want these governments to change and to be more civil to Christianity and, and to have a more moral position. You pray to God about this person. And you pray, Lord, that they would change in their heart, that God would give them the mind of a, of a saved man rather than the mind of an unsaved person, that their perspective would change and that they would get a renewed mind uh, dropped from out of foolishness and no longer enslaved 
by their lusts and pleasures. And so in this political season that we seem to be finding ourselves in, we need to be looking at that and say, yes, of course, that's how they would act. They don't understand. Even Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross and being put to death by the Roman soldiers and being railed upon by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And so you see people acting like sinners, and they are lost. They're wandering stars without a proper orbit. They're deceived. They're without a mind. They're run by their pleasures. You pray to God, and you ask God, to save that person, to open up their mind, to put grace upon this person that they might be saved. Kings and queens and senators and governors and presidents and all that, that their mind might be changed and the light of the world, Jesus Christ, would come into their hearts and they would be saved.